In this presentation, we will take a look at chapters 2 through 4 in the book of John, the Gospel of John. As always, I would encourage you to read these chapters before watching the presentation so you're familiar with the details of the story. And those listening into audio format only, this is a YouTube presentation where I have slides that you can go to my YouTube channel anytime if you want to take a look at those and see some of the quotes that I give in here. That YouTube channel is Coming Unto Christ, Michael S. Clough. Let's begin with John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, where we come across the first recorded miracle that Christ does the turning of water to wine. Brother Elder Bruce R. McConkie gives what he calls the Law of Miracles. Quoting from his book, The Mortal Messiah, he writes, we, ordinary think, we ordinarily think of miracles as those signs and wonders and marvels which God does for his people because they have faith in him and which they cannot do for themselves. More often than not, these performances seem to transcend natural laws, though in fact they are always in complete harmony with them and are simply the manifestation of higher laws not generally known to mortal men. Miracles are a part of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are one of the chief characteristics of true believers. They, where they are found, there are the Lord's people. Where they are not found, there the Lord's people are not. They are the signs that deity gives to identify those who have faith. Faith is power, the power of God. Unless men have power, among other things, to perform miracles, they do not have faith. God is a God of miracles, everlastingly, always, and without exception, he performs miracles among his people. The decree is that signs shall follow them that believe. Unless the signs are present, the beliefs involved are not founded upon the rock of eternal truth, who is Christ. God is an unchangeable being, a being with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. If it were not so, he would cease to be God, which he cannot do. And because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, miracles are always found among those who have faith. Again, Mortal Messiah, Book 1, page 446. One thing that I would add or caution that I would give is sometimes we do not recognize miracles in our lives because maybe they are not showy or flashy. Never once does it say that miracles have to grab our attention with just extreme amount of awe. Sometimes some of the simplest things, the birth of a child, is a miracle. Being able to breathe air on a daily basis without giving it a second thought is a miracle. The creation of our bodies and the way they're put together. But as he says... Where faith is, miracles will also proceed. Again, not the miracles we deem necessary, the miracles that he sees fit to bestow upon us. That could be another reason why we miss them. The marriage feast in Canaan of Galilee, just a little background. On the evening of the marriage, the bride was taken into a bridal procession to her husband's home. It was customary for friends and neighbors and onlookers to join the procession. A formal ceremony was performed, a legal instrument was signed, the required washings were performed, and benediction spoken. The cup was filled, blessed and drunk, and the marriage supper commenced. The marriage feast lasted from a day to a week or more, with a governor of the feast acting as master of ceremonies. John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it is clear that Jesus is called to the marriage. So it appears that his mother Mary had some role in the serving of the guests, which some feel that perhaps this marriage was a relative. That Jesus doesn't, doesn't ha just happen to come upon the marriage, and his mother just 
happens to be there. He is called and bidden to the marriage. John chapter 3, verses 2 through 5, is not a rebuke. The way it's written in the King James Version, when his mother turns to him and asks for help because they've run out of wine, you almost get this rebuke type of thing. What do I have to do with thee? My time has not yet come, that kind of thing. Well, the Joseph Smith translation, John chapter 2, verse 4, straightens this out and says, Jesus saith unto her woman, and you need to understand in Hebrew woman, which is the word isha, is a, a, a word of great reverence, of respect. That, 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 that's not used today. Back then, that was a great sign of respect and nobility. And so this is the highest compliment he could say to his mother. Woman, what wilt thou have me to do for thee? That will I do, for mine hour is not yet come. It's, it's not coming for me time for my atonement to die and all of that. What is it you need me to do for thee? That will I do. And so the JST clears that up greatly. Again, Elder Bruce R. McConkie writes, But we are left to surmise what Mary expected Jesus to do, and it is not unreasonable to conclude that she wanted him to use his divine power. She knew God was his father. She knew of the angelic message sent at his birth and of the heavenly choirs that sang hosannas to his name. She had heard the testimony of Simeon and Anna in the temple. She had seen the wise men from the east and heard their witness. She knew of the angelic direction Joseph had received, and she had received the gentle rebuke. Wist not that I must be about my father's business when she and Joseph found their twelve-year-old son in the temple. Of all of this we are certain. And we cannot avoid the conclusion that between Jesus' 12th and 30th there, there were many marvelous and miraculous things of which Mary knew. There is no reason to believe that there was a spiritual drought of 18 years, a period when all that was divine and heavenly should be obscured. Surely she would have been told of her son's baptism, if indeed she was not present, and of the descent of the Holy Ghost upon him, and of the voice from heaven, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. In this setting, how can we do, uh, how can we do other than suppose that Mary expected her son to provide the wine that would assure the success of the celebration then underway? Ellen McConkie makes a great point. She knew of his divine powers and of his divinity. And who knows between that 12th birthday, uh, that 12th birth, uh, age in the temple when he declares he knows who he is, be about my father's business, until now that many wonders and wonderful things were not done that she has witnessed. And so she naturally goes to him and knows that she, he can use his divine powers to help them in their time of need. John 2, verses 6 through 7, talk about six water pots. But they were specific water pots that were used for the ritual washing of hands before a meal. Now let's take a look at that. It was the practice of the Jews, imposed by the Pharisees, to ritually, for purification, wash their hands before eating. Thus the six water pots when filled to the brim, would have contained about 150 gallons of water. So this is not just he provided a cup of wine. He turns probably 150 gallons of water to wine. No small, simple feat indeed. Perhaps Jesus was using these specific water pots to teach that it will be by the miracle of his atonement that we become clean, and not by the ritualistic hand-washing of men. Understand at this time that the Pharisee rules, 
that they had of hand washing and Sabbath day observance and all of this that Christ never gave were just followed to the nth degree of specification, thinking that would save men. And so perhaps Jesus chooses those specific water pots to say no. It is the miracle of my atonement, which wine we know in the sacrament represents, is what will save you. Not these ritualistic ordinances or deeds you have come up with. Every hour of every day, somewhere on earth, the Lord turns water into wine. By this power, pursuant to the laws he has ordained, men prepare the soil and plant the vine. From the good earth, from the rains that fall, and from the light of the sun, the vine takes nutrient, grows, and bears fruit. Men dung it and dig about it and prune it, and the fruit matures and ripens. They harvest the crop and process it in the wine vat, and it be comes out as wine on the lees, well refined. It is a miracle. God is performing, turning water into wine as a process of planting, harvesting, and then producing. And, and that miracle has been going on for years. It's just in this case, in this instant, the process, inexplicable to us, was sped up and done in an instant. <coughs> Excuse me. So like I mentioned, <coughs> Excuse me. as we talk about faith and miracles, we see miracles every day. Food that is grown, that's a miraculous process of planting seed, taking care of it, watering, sunshine, and producing food. The sun just had the ability to speed up the process of something that we see miracles happening every day. If you have the faith to plant the seed and follow the laws of growing it, the miracle will produce what the seed has in it that fruit or that vegetable or whatever. Let's now turn to John chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Jesus cleanses the temple now after he has performed this great miracle. Elabrus Omniconchi provides a vivid picture of what it must have been like in the temple grounds and what was really going on. Listen to this and picture what is taking place here and why the Savior is just a little indignant why he does what he does. Jesus and his group came into the outer court, the court of the Gentiles. There they looked upon a scene of unholy merchandising that desecrated the temple and testified against those who were engaged in its money-grubbing practices. There they saw the money changers, those who examined sacrificial animals for a fee, the sellers of sheep, and the hawkers of oxen and doves. The noise and the haggling destroyed the very vestige of reverence. The lowing of cattle and the bleating of sheep drowned out the priestly performances nearby. And the filth and stench of the barnyard so overpowered the senses that arriving pilgrims soon lost the desire to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. It was a scene of desecration, of physical filth, and of spiritual degeneracy. For a fee, those who brought their own sacrificial animals had to examine at the temple for Levitical fitness. All that was needed for meat offering and drink offerings was for sale in the sacred walls. Auction, sheep, doves could be purchased outright. Profiters earned or extorted through all these sacrifices. Related merchandising went both to the individual and to the temple officials. Sums paid for the items needed for meat and drink offerings went directly to the temple. Others paid rent for the use of temple space. Even a temple market, referred to as the bazaar of the sons of Annas, occupied part of the space in the court. Annas was, of course, the high priest before whom Jesus would stand in three years during another Passover season. There was considerable popular resentment against the sons of Annas and their temple merchandising. 
quoting Edersheim, from the unrighteousness of the traffic carried on in these bazaars and the greed of their owners, Edersheim says, the temple market was at the time most unpopular. Sickened by the stench and the filth, repulsed by the jangling and haggling of paltry coins were exchanged, saddened by the complete absence of spirituality which the chosen people should have been so richly endowed, the son of him whose house these evil miscreants then desecrated made a scourge of small cords. Then filled with indignant justice, his righteous anger blazing forth in physical strength, he of whom Moses had said, the Lord is a man of war, this Galilean from Nazareth drove out the sheep of the oxen and those in whose custody they load and bleated. To the keepers of the doves he commanded, take these things hence. With force and violence he overturned the temples of the money changers, scattering their ill-gotten coins amid the dirt and dung on the marble floor. To those who bought and sold, who haggled in the temple bazaars, and whose hearts were set on laying up treasures on earth rather than heaven, with a voice of authority he declared, Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. I think he paints a beautiful picture of how chaotic and worldly this had become. You need to understand that the outer court, the court of the Gentiles, could hold over 200,000 people in it. Can you imagine the amount of animals and stuff that they had that they were selling, the amount of people and that said, the amount of dung that must have been there and the smells that must have been there. No wonder he was just a little upset of how they were treating his holy sacred house and the surrounding environment. John chapter 2, verses 18 through 19. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it again. The only sign I give unto an adulterous and wicked generation is the sign of Joseph, jo- Jonas. That is, in three days in the belly of the well, he comes forth again. Three days, Christ is in the grave, and he comes forth. The resurrection is absolute proof that he is the Son of God. Only God could resurrect himself. In other words, show us a sign. That's what they were clamoring. What proof can you offer that you are entitled to cleanse the courts of the temple? The mere fact that they asked such a question shows that doubt and fear were rising in their minds. What if this man really is the Messiah, as his disciples say? So that's why they're asking proof. Doubt has arisen in their minds. They again want him to give some demonstration of his proof. He says, the only sign I'll give you is the sign of my resurrection. Let's now turn to John chapter 3, the story of Jesus and Nicodemus. John chapter 3, verse 2, it says, The same, which is Nicodemus, came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Isn't that interesting? A couple of things in here. First of all, by night. Perhaps Nicodemus is a part of the Jewish Sanhedrin, the ruling body. And he is just maybe a little fearful to show his complete devotion to Christ in the daytime. And that says, we know. So there were others amongst the Jewish leaders. They know this is the Son of God who has come among them. It's not like they will turn against him and not know who he is. John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see 
the kingdom of God. Meaning God and his gospel and church can only be seen and known by the Spirit. That's why people come into the church. That's why they join. That's why people stay. The Spirit speaks to their spirit. The Holy Ghost gives them revelation. That's the only way you can see and know that the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is true. The same was true then. Nicodemus, you must have the Spirit to see that the church I'm restoring at this time in the meridian of time is true. John chapter 3, verse 4. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? This shows how literal and misguided the Pharisees had become in their scripture study. Here is a man that claims to be one of the leaders of the Jewish people. Not just civilly, but religiously. And he doesn't even understand the doctrine of being born again. That's how literal they were taking scripture and how misguided they had become in their interpretation because they were vo devoid of the Spirit of God. John chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So you must have the spirit of revelation to see the kingdom of God, to know which church is true, and then to enter into the gate, into God's kingdom, the celestial kingdom, one must be born of the water and the spirit. This is clearly and plainly taught in Moses chapter 6, verses 58 through 62. Here's what Moses said. Therefore I give unto you a commandment to teach these things freely unto your children, saying, That by reason of transgression cometh the fall, which fall bringeth death, and inasmuch as you were born into the world by water, blood, and the Spirit, which I have made, and so become of dust a living soul, even so you must be born again into the kingdom of heaven, of water, and of the Spirit, and be cleansed by blood, even the blood of mine only begotten, that you might be sanctified from all sin, and enjoy the words of eternal life in this world, and eternal life in the world to come, even immortal glory. For by the water you keep the commandments, by the Spirit you are justified, and by the blood you ye are sanctified. Therefore it is given to you to abide in you the record of heaven, the comforter, the peaceable things of immortal glory, the truth of all things, that which quickeneth all things, that which maketh alive all things, that which knoweth all things, and hath all power according to wisdom, mercy, justice, truth, justice, and judgment. And now, behold, I say unto you, this is the plan of salvation unto all men, through the blood of mine only begotten, who shall come in the meridian of time. You couldn't teach it in more plainer words. This is the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis, which was one time in the Old Testament, Nicodemus should have known these words spoken by Moses. It shows you how far afield they had become of the true doctrine. Just like your blood, water, and spirit is present in physical birth. Through water and the blood of Christ and the spirit of the Holy Ghost, one must be born again into Christ's kingdom to enter the gate into the gate of the celestial kingdom. John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, then he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten of the Son. There must be a difference between believing in Christ and believing on Christ or he would have not have said 
both of them. Let's just take a look at that for a minute. First of all, what does it mean to believe? Believe, from the 1828 Webster Dictionary, means to expect, hope with confidence, to trust, a yielding of the will and affections accompanied with a humble reliance on Christ for salvation. So belief is not just a mere cognitive thing that we think or we say with our lips, I believe in Christ, and then that's the end. It's not just some mere statement of fact or of knowledge that I have. Belief is yielding to Christ and yielding to his will and his affections, and then you humbly rely upon him. So if you believe in something, you will do it. In means denotes present or enclosed, surrounded by limits. So to believe in Christ is to focus on him, to come enclosed by him. I will only yield to him, not to anyone else. I will yield to the will of Christ and focus on the Savior. Have limits set by the Savior. That's believing in him. On means to pass, to approach, to come to, or to meet. So to believe on Christ is to come unto him, to meet him, and to approach Christ and do what he says. So as I focus my attention on him, then I come to him and willingly submit to his will. That's what it means to believe in him and to believe on him. John chapter 3 verse 33, he that hath received his, Jesus' testimony, has set his seal that God is true. What does that mean? Meaning, those who believe his witness and obey his counsels have a seal placed upon them that they are sealed up into eternal life in their everlasting kingdom of the Father. Let's now turn to John chapter 4, the last chapter we'll consider in this presentation. Jesus and the woman from Samaria at the well of water, a, a well-known story. Let's take a look at how we are always told that we learn line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. This story exemplifies that pattern of teaching. Notice the progression in this woman as she is willing, and here's the key, willing to continue to hear Christ, even at a time when she could have become offended and left, which some do in this church. They become offended and then they leave Christ instead of willing to maybe take chastisement when needed and to wait and learn line upon line, precept upon precept. So this is John chapter 4, verses 4 through 29. Let's take a look at the story and how, it te how she learns line upon line. Because of her willingness to stay with Christ. She could have left at any time. Starting with verse 4. And he, Christ, must needs go through Samaria. Why, why must he? Well, because there's a woman who is ready to hear the gospel that he needs to go teach. And then through her, a whole village will be taught. That's why he must needs go through Samaria. He knows that. Verse 5. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Verse 6. Now Jacob's well was there, Jesus, therefore, being weary with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. That gives the great insight. Yes, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He did have immortality in him, but he was also part mortal. He got tired. He got thirsty. And this is one of those things where he also was burdened with some of the burdens we feel, immortality. Verse 7. Then cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. Verse 8. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Verse 9. 
Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, unto him, How is it thou being a Jew askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. So we get again that insight to the the contention that was had amongst the Jews and the Samaritans. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou would have, wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. If you knew who was sitting beside you here, you would have asked very different questions. Well, verse 11, the woman said unto him, Sir, so she's very polite, very respectful, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, the well is deep, and from whence then hast thou this living water? So it's obviously she is not in tune with the Spirit. She does not understand the spiritual level that he is trying to teach her. She needs to learn. Verse 12, Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Can you just bring the water up? Are you greater than them? You have nothing to draw this water with. Verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. You'll have to come back day after day as you have been doing for these so many years. Verse 14, But whosoever drinketh the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. And now take a look at verse 15 to let us know that she definitely is not being influenced by the Spirit yet, and it does not is not on the same level he is. The woman said unto her, Sir, so again, that respectful title, Give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Oh my goodness, you mean I, I, you can give me water and I don't have to come out here day after day after day to draw water? See, she's not quite there yet, is she? So look what the Savior does. Jesus said unto her, Go, call thy husband and come hither. Verse 17, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, thou hast well said, I have no husband. You know, she could have just lied. See, he's going to expose her adulterous relationship. Could you imagine how would you feel if you were just accused by the Savior or by anyone of committing adultery and that was exposed? Wouldn't it be tempting to give offense and try to cover it up? That's the very natural and mortal and human thing to do. Verse 6, 18. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast is not thy husband, in that says thou truly. He has now said, I know, you live in adultery, don't you? It's amazing she just doesn't get up and leave and say, oh, I can't. No, that's not true. I don't know. Can you imagine sticking around when your sins are exposed? But look at her reply to her great credit. Look what all the things she could have said. She could have become offended and just left him. As I said, many in the church do. When certain things happen, they become offended and they just leave. Instead of maybe learning what they need to learn. Her reply, the woman said, and, Sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. See, now we've gone from sir to prophet. Her eyes are starting to slowly open. She's starting to see something and perhaps even feel something different. I perceive thou art a prophet. What a response. Her willingness to stay there and be taught in the midst of being chastised for living in adultery. Again, I don't think he said it with a harsh voice or anything like that, but she is being exposed. Even then, living in adultery was a shameful act. 
And yet she stays and listens to him and says, oh my goodness, you must be a prophet to know that about me. And we are strangers. Verse 20. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. See, there's going to come a time after his resurrection, right? As apostles will now continue to organize the church, and they will separate themselves from the Jews in Jerusalem. Verse 22. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. And that's true. Christ is Jewish. Salvation is from them. He knows who he is, and he knows the Father whom he worships. He's saying, you do not know what you worship. The religion that they had was an apostate form of Judaism. Verse 23 but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. We come to church, brothers and sisters, to seek the spirit and worship in truth and in the spirit. We're not there to pick out other people's sins or to see if they're hypocrites. That's their problem. No, I come to worship. I don't come to see, to judge others or to see if they're judging me or to focus on that. I go to focus on the Savior through the Spirit. That's what he's saying. Verse 24. And this is the Joseph Smith translation that clears up where it says God is a spirit in this verse. It says, For unto such hath God promised his spirit, and they who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Yes, sacrament will become dull and boring if you do not worship in spirit and in truth. That's what we go there for. We do not go there to be entered. Or even in a sense to be instructed by the person, but to be instructed by the Holy Ghost. And that is encumbered upon each of us individually on whether that happens, regardless of who's speaking from the pulpit. Verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. I will follow him. I perceive you're a prophet, but when the Messiah cometh, I will follow him. Verse 26, And Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Notice I bolded the two words, I am. He uses that great title from Exodus. I am is before you. The great I am. I am he. The Messiah is sitting here again. The Pharisees and a lot of the Jews were offended when Christ ever said that and wouldn't believe on him and left him because he dared claim to be the Son of God. He now declares it to her. Verse 27, And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman, yet no man said, What speakest thou, or why talkest thou with her? Verse 29, the woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, Now take a look at her spiritual progression. Verse 29. Come and see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? So she goes from sir to prophet and then from prophet to Christ. Because she willingly stayed with him and listened to him. That's how we learn. Regardless if someone offends us in the church. What are the odds that someone will offend you in church? Well, my goodness, the percentage is 100% because we're all mortal. Let's grow up and get over that, can we, in this day and age? I don't think standing before Christ in the judgment and saying, well, I was offended at church, that that excuse is going to enable you to get into the kingdom and cause you to excuse you from the neglect of keeping his commandments. Come on, let's be real and honest about this. Here she was willing 
to stay with him and listen and learn, regardless of what was exposed about her or what Christ declared about himself. She stayed with him and felt the Spirit, and now she goes and testifies of Christ. Is not this the Christ? Then if you finish the story, it talks about how people came out to meet him, and he taught them, and others believed, not because of her, but believed because of the teachings of Christ on him. This woman, willing, willing to wait upon the Lord and stay with him, even when she could have been offended, she learns line upon line, precept upon precept because she stayed with him and continued to listen that is our challenge that is our church in charge in this church of course there's going to be offenses that come of course there are going to be things that happen that are not going to be right of course people are going to make mistakes that is not the issue the issue is will you stay with christ come what may no matter what you will stay with him and his church and just focus on him not on others not what others say or do or think but you will focus on him with the spirit and worship him in spirit and truth that is the great challenge that is how you and i learn line upon line precept upon precept well thank you for watching if you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and please consider subscribing to the channel. Thank you.